take your Bible, be turning with me to uh, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew, the 10th chapter, in a moment we'll just read the first four verses. In Matthew chapter 10, we begin a new series of messages in, around the, the uh, question, is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth it? Well, we know the answer is yes, he surely is, but I want us to examine it even more closely why is he worth it? Why is he worth everything? And he ought to be worth everything to you and to me. Next week, we have Nick Ripkin and Ruth coming to be with us for the Insanity of God experience. And one of the questions that he has posed in his powerful testimony is that question, is Jesus worth it? As he talked to people who were, their lives were threatened, many of them had lost family members in different parts of the world. They were persecuted for their faith. And so he asked the question, is Jesus worth it? And the powerful testimonies they shared answered the question more eloquently than we could ever imagine. Yes, he is worth absolutely everything. And so we're going to be talking about that this morning. I'm speaking on the calling of Jesus. Is it worth it? The calling of Jesus. Now, Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to read just the first four verses the Bible says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lobias, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Father in heaven, I pray that you will bless the reading of your word. And Father, help us today to hear and to learn those things from your word that will challenge our hearts to know that truly Jesus is worth it. He's worth everything, worth following at all costs in order that we might live uh, for your glory. For we ask this in the precious name of our Savior. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you need something new in your life, something to challenge you, something different, something that, uh, that would just uh, change your entire life. Well, I want to tell you, you've come to the right place because there is only one who can absolutely change a life in that one is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never met him as your Savior, if you're not absolutely certain if you were to die that you'd go to heaven, I promise you, if you will come to Christ and receive him as your Lord, he will change your life. You will learn the real meaning of life, and you'll find it, you'll discover it in our glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus. I also want to say, if your relationship to Jesus has grown somewhat stale, if you don't find the same passion and zeal and excitement that you once knew in your walk with the Lord, maybe you need a fresh new encounter with Jesus. Maybe you need to come once again to the cross, even as our choir was singing that song about uh, the cross of Calvary, the gift of our dear Savior. Maybe you need to be reminded again of all that he has done for you. Because I'm going to tell you something. If anyone is moved in the relationship, it's not God. It's not him, it's you. An elderly man and woman were driving their old truck one day and a, a sleek automobile pulled around them rather quickly and it was a, a guy and obviously his girlfriend and as they pulled around, the lady noticed that the girl was sitting so close to the boy that it looked like the two of them were just one. I mean, she was sitting right there next to him. She looked at her husband and said, I remember when we used to sit like that. And the old man said, well, I ain't moved. <laughs> Well, I want to tell you something, dear friend. If your relationship is not as close with Jesus as it once was, it's not because he's moved. It's because you've moved. God is always willing to meet you once again and to challenge your life and change your heart. Now, we come in this passage of Scripture, and immediately what we encounter 
is a list of names. And it is the names of the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I feel like I don't want to just skip over so quickly these names and move on down some more verses. As a matter of fact, really, I'd almost like to preach from every one of these different apostles. But if I would ever finish the book of Matthew, it would be in the middle of the millennium sometime. So I probably just need to go ahead and preach this message and talk about them. But how exciting and how thrilling it is to think about these apostles of the Lord. Do you know that four times in the Bible, in Matthew, in Mark, again in Luke, all of these apostles are mentioned together. John doesn't give their list of their names, but then in the book of Acts, we have 11 of the 12. Judas is not mentioned because by the time Acts is written, it's already after the death of Judas. He has already died, and so he's not mentioned among them. But four times you have the list of these apostles given in the Word of God. Now, there are several similarities about these lists and several lessons that we can learn as we think about how God used these people. And I believe one of the most powerful things about each one of the men, 11 of them anyway, 11 of these 12 men, if we could call them to the courthouse of this place today, if we could ask for their testimony without equivocation, without hesitation, they each one would say, it was worth it to serve Jesus. It was worth it to do what I did for the glory of my Lord. Yes, it was worth it. He's worth it. And so I want us to think about these 12 men. I want you to notice, first of all, that the Bible mentions Peter first. First, Simon Peter. In each one of the lists, you find Peter mentioned first by the Lord in the testimony of the 12 apostles. Now, it wasn't because he was the first one to come to Christ. He was not the first one to come to Christ. As a matter of fact, Andrew, his brother, was saved before Peter was. And the Bible tells us it was Andrew who went out and found his brother and brought him to Jesus. And so Simon Peter, he was not mentioned first because he was the first one to come to Christ, but he's mentioned first each of these times because in the wisdom of God and in the providence of God, Peter became the leader of the apostles. He was the captain of the team, so to speak. He was their quarterback. He was first because God chose him to be the leader of the group. On several occasions in the New Testament, we find the Lord speaking with these apostles, and we find Jesus will ask some probing question, wanting to get a response from them. For example, one time he said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And who do you say that I am? And we find over and over again it was Peter who was the spokesman. And Peter answered and said, Those words will almost inevitably follow a question from the Lord that comes to the 12 apostles. He was the leader. Everything rises or falls on leadership. And God chose him in his wisdom and in his providence. He chose him to be the leader of this group. But I want you to notice that not only was Simon Peter always mentioned first, but Judas Iscariot was always mentioned last. He was the last one mentioned, and always when Judas Iscariot was mentioned in every time in the Word of God, it was along with this epitaph, he was the one who betrayed the Lord. Judas, who betrayed the Savior. What a tremendously horrible evil obituary to put on the life or epitaph to put on the life of any individual. He was a traitor. He was the one who betrayed the Lord. Mentioned last in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke because of his treacherous deed of denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot more we could say about Judas. Judas, I want to tell you, I'm going to preach later about him, so I'll not belabor the point right now, but he was lost. He was a devil from the beginning. He really was. He's in hell today because of his wickedness. His heart was evil and wicked. You say, well, pastor, why would the Lord choose him? Well, God chose him because that was in the plan of God, the providential plan of God. God selected him to be one of those early apostles, but the Lord knew. He knew his heart. 
and his heart was evil and wicked. Now the Bible also mentions these others here. For example, uh, there actually was another apostle whose name was Judas too. His name was Judas and here in this uh, gospel, he's called Abias or Thaddeus. In all three of the other gospels, he's referred to, or the other two gospels, he's referred to as Judas. You see, Judas was not a bad name in that day and in that time. It was actually quite a popular name. And there are several men in the Bible whose names were Judas, and most of them were honorable and good men. They really were good men. You know, the Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great wealth. What a tragedy that Judas Iscariot ruined a perfectly good name, but he did. He ruined a perfectly good name. It's no wonder that perhaps by the time Matthew penned his gospel that he referred to him as Labias or Thaddeus because apparently Judas decided, I'm not going to use that name anymore. And so he went by one of his other names. Almost all of us have more than one name. I have a Michael Wayne Thompson, and I have more than one name. And uh, Joel, on a video some years ago, actually called me Little Mikey T. Can you believe that? Little Mikey T. Now, I was tempted to be insulted, but, but think about it. He called me Little Mikey T. And why would I be upset about that? Little Mikey T. Now, that does probably says more about his poor eyesight than anything else. But anyway, it's not unusual for us to have more than one name that we're referred to as, uh, as certain things. But Judas, who was Thaddeus, decided, I'm not going to use the name Judas anymore. It's interesting. I, I've met lots of little boys uh, whose moms and dads and lots of men whose moms and dad named them Peter or Andrew or Thomas or, or James or John. And uh, he, he, even names like Nathaniel. I mean, all of those names, you, you meet young people, you meet children that have those names. But nobody names their children Judas. I've met a family or two who had a dog they called Judas, but never a child they'd call Judas. It's kind of like the Old Testament name Jezebel. Here was Jezebel who ruined that name forever and ever. You don't ever find a woman whose name is Jezebel, or if it is, she'd never admit to it. Judas ruined that name once and for all. Well, then the Bible also tells us of three sets of brothers. Three sets of brothers that are mentioned here. The first set of brothers that the Bible mentions here, Andrew and Peter. Andrew and Peter. And what a story is the story of Andrew. Andrew was kind of in the background. Peter was the spokesman. He became the leader. But the Bible says of Andrew that he first found his own brother and brought him to Jesus. What a wonderful thing to have a brother or to have a sister. What a great thing it is. I'm privileged to have a brother still living, and I enjoy. We have a lot of things we enjoy talking about, things we have in common, and so forth. And I love my brother. I'm grateful for him. I really am. Well, Andrew had a brother whose name was Peter. And I want to tell you, in John chapter 1, there's a verse in John chapter 1 that tells about what Andrew did whenever he met Jesus. And what he did really is the secret to building any church. Any great church is, is uh, the secret to building it is found in whether or not you are doing exactly what happens in John chapter 1. Listen to verse 40 and verse 41. The Bible says one of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. You know, when those verses speak of the things that Andrew did, Notice the Bible says, first of all, he found his brother. In other words, he went out and made contact. He had met Jesus, and he could not rest until he went to somebody that he loved, somebody that he cared about, and he made a personal contact with them. That's called visitation. And you know how a church is built up? You know how attendance can grow in a church? It's through visitation. You take the word visitation, and the first letters of the word are the word vision. 
vision. And so when we have a vision for people that we care about, when we, when we love Jesus and we want them to know Jesus, we want them to meet the same Savior that we're privileged to know, then we have a heart for them and we go out and make contact with them. We go on visitation. Now, when we go and make contact with them, you know, we don't go and say, well, you think the Patriots will lose a ball game this year? You think they'll make the Super Bowl? You plan on going to the chariot races this weekend? Uh, how's the weather over at your play? You know, we don't talk about those kind of things. No. What did he do? The Bible says when he found his brother, he said to him, we found the Messiah. We found the Christ. That's witnessing. And so you make contact, but when you make contact, you don't, you know, well, I'm going to come tell you all about our, our beautiful building, our theater seats, and our media is cool, and, and our pastor is so handsome, and, and this and the other. You know, no, we don't talk about those things. Those things are so unimportant. What do we do? We talk about Jesus. We talk about Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother, and he said, listen, we found him. We, you got to come. You got to meet. We found the Christ. We found the Messiah. We found the Savior. You need to come and meet Him. And so you see, that's witnessing. And so if a church is determined to do what God has called us to do, then it begins with a vision. So you make those contacts, and it includes witnessing. And then the third thing, the Bible says, and He brought him to Jesus. That's so winning. He brought him to Jesus. That's so winning. And, and praise God for those who are bringing folks to Jesus, soul winning. In other words, he wasn't going to rest. He wasn't going to be content until he got his own brother to Jesus. He was determined to get him to Jesus. I want to tell you something. Whenever you read about how God used Peter, what God did with Peter, thank God. Thank God Andrew was determined to bring his own brother to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, those three things will build up any church. There's no, no mystery to it. There's nothing to it at all. Look, I mean, if we have a vision, we make contacts, we talk about Jesus, and we bring people to Jesus. Now, you can build a crowd doing a lot of things, but you won't build a church. You can give away plastic alligators or baby monkeys or come tell them to, you're going to have a singing bird or but whatever you use to build the crowd, you got to keep doing to keep the crowd. But when you introduce them to Jesus, you don't just build a crowd, you build the kingdom of God. Folks will fall in love with Jesus. And after all, isn't that really, isn't that really the heart of the problem right there? You see, Andrew fell in love with Jesus. He said, this is the Messiah. This is the one that will change your life. Peter, you've got to go. You've got to meet him. You've got to hear him. You've got to see this man. He had fallen in love with Jesus, and his love compelled him to go and find another. See, I think sometimes the real problem is that we're not infatuated with Jesus. When the Tennessee Vols were winning all the football games, especially when they went to the national championship uh, a couple of decades ago, you know, I mean, Neyland Stadium was huge, but they got, had to build it bigger. We're going to have to have more than 100,000 seats in this thing. And they would fill the place. I mean, fill it. They still fill it for a lot of occasions. Now, when they don't win, they don't fill every seat. But I mean, when they do win, they fill every seat. People pay to get in. They walk 30 miles up and down the hills because there's no parking nearby. 100,000-seat football stadium with about 12 parking spaces. Amen? But they go. Why? Because they're infatuated with their team. They love their team. The real problem, we're not in love with Jesus like we need to be. I have to beg and plead and almost bribe folks to get them to come to church. We need someone to help teach the boys and girls and tell them about Jesus. Would you be willing to? Well, you know, I just, I don't think I can. Well, all you have to do is a couple of times a year. Oh, you know, it's so hard. When we're infatuated with Jesus, when we're in love with Jesus, we relish every opportunity and every moment that we can talk to others about him. And so the first set of brothers, Andrew and Peter. But back to Matthew chapter 1 and notice there's a second set of brothers that are mentioned. And that second set is James and John. 
the sons of, of Zebedee, James and John. And these two are mentioned in the Word of God. Now, we don't know a whole lot about James. This is not the James who wrote the book of James. That was the half-brother of Jesus. But this is James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. Now, God used John to write five books of the New Testament. The Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. But this is James. What do we know about him we know in Acts chapter 12 that Herod was on the rampage and he arrested this James. And though Stephen was the first Christian martyr, James was the first apostolic martyr. Herod ran through his body with a sword and killed him. He was a martyr. He died the first apostle, the first disciple to be put to death, to be martyred for his faith. But I submit to you with everything that is within me, if James could stand here this morning, and if you were to say to him, James, was Jesus worth it? Was it worth it? Your life was cut short. You were martyred. You were killed by that evil Herod. Was Jesus worth it? And without hesitation, he would say 10,000 times, yes, he's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth everything. He means everything to me. His brother was John. John, no doubt, was a teenager when he came to Christ. I love young people. I love to see young people get on fire for the Lord. You know, young people, if they get on fire for the Lord, it's amazing what they can do. The problem is it's so hard to get them on fire for the Lord. But when they get excited about Jesus, it's amazing what they can do. Just get excited about the Lord. When I was in Dallas, Texas, years and years ago, we had a bus ministry. We got teenagers involved, just about five or six of us, just about five or six young people, teenagers. I was 15 and 16 and 17 years old, and the church had to keep buying buses to get all the We had 450 kids on a Sunday that five or six teenagers would go round them up and bring them to church. Those young people were all ordained to ministry. I was ordained the same time there were five of us ordained to the gospel ministry on the same night. Because you see, when young people get excited, you know what Mark tells us? Jesus had a nickname for James and John. You know what that nickname was? He called them the sons of thunder. That's what he called James and John. That's what Jesus said. They're the sons of thunder. I wonder why he called them the sons of thunder. I bet it was not because they were kind of quiet and unassuming and, and mousy and afraid to speak out. No, they were young guys. John was a teenager. I, I bet they were kind of loud and boisterous, and they probably pulled the pranks on everybody and the jokes. And, and, and I mean, you know, and, and they were outspoken and brash, and sometimes they, they would open their mouth just long enough to stick the other foot in it. You know, that's, sometimes that's what you do when you're young. I remember when I came to East Tennessee, my first charge, my first assignment was to be a youth pastor at Glenwood Baptist Church, and, and uh, we were getting ready to go on a retreat, a, a, a Bible conference, so to speak, and, and the pastor said, you know, now when y'all get back, I better not have the kids uh, testify that didn't go too well last time. And what had happened is before I got there, some of the kids, they went to a youth meeting. They got all fired up. They got all excited. And they gave them the floor the following Sunday night. And you know, as kids might do, they pointed to those uh, folks sitting out there and they said, bless God, y'all need to get busy. You need to get off your blessed assurance and go to work for Jesus. <laughs> well, the older folks didn't like that much come from those teenagers. Well, I want to tell you something. <laughs> I, I'd rather have some wood that's, uh, that's hot and you can burn than something that's cold and wet that has no fire to it. Amen? That's the problem with a lot of us. We don't have enough fire in us to get excited about Jesus. We don't need to be cooled off. We're already freezing. But here was James and John, the sons of thunder. I like to, I like to listen to the thunder sometimes. You know, when there's a storm. You know, I, we have a little sunroom with a metal roof. And uh, my next wife, I, I, I tell her, you're going to have to get us a metal roof so I can listen to the rain. Debbie said, I don't want no metal roof. 
<laughs> I'm joking. Anyway, but you like to get us a metal roof. I like to listen to the thunder. And one night, you know, out there in the sunroom, you know, I'm listening to the thunder, and all of a sudden, clap! It just hit mighty close. Felt like it jarred my teeth. I come running in the house. That was, you know, laughing like a Cheshire cat. I bet you, you yeah, yeah, you, you like the thunder, don't you? But James and John, they, they were the sons of thunder. Then, notice the Bible also, it also speaks of Philip, who brought his friend Bartholomew. Philip and Bartholomew. By the way, I, I've left out the other James and Thaddeus. I don't want to do that. Let me mention them first, and I'll get to Philip. There was James. Mark calls him James the Less. So there were two Jameses. James the Less was the one that is the brother of Thaddeus. Now, I'm sure when they called him James the Less, probably some folks said, I bet he didn't like that very much, James the Less. Oh, he probably didn't bother him at all. It's kind of like, you know, a family member is named after another family member, and so you maybe have Big Jim and Little Jim, you know. And so there was that one James, and his brother was Thaddeus or Labias, and and, uh, and he's called that in the first three of the Gospels. But in John, he's called Nathaniel. Same one, Nathaniel. Now, I know some liberals that quibble over that. They say, well, now, why does the Bible give different names? They're picking apart the Bible. He's called Thaddeus, but over here in John, he's called Nathaniel. And it's kind of like they're searching for gnats in a swimming pool. They just find anything they can in the Bible and say, I'm going to criticize it. But listen, I told you earlier, we, we, ha we have different names that we're referred to. I mean, we have different names we go by. Almost everybody in this building, I bet, I bet there's different names. Some, some of you be called, you know, my name's Michael legally, but I, I'm called Mike. And some folks, I have to be sure and ask if they're in the hospital. Now, tell me what your legal name is, because when I go over there and ask for the name I know you by, they may not tell me you're there. Because we almost all have more than one name. Sometimes we have a nickname we don't really want anybody to know, do we? Huh? I don't want you to know my nickname. Well, these men in the Bible, they had names they went by too, and some of them had two or three names they went by. And such was the case with James and his brother Thaddeus or Nathaniel. But they were apostles of the Lord. And then the Bible mentions Philip. Philip. Now, we don't know what Philip did for a living. But I know one thing, he had a good friend, and his good friend was Bartholomew, Bartholomew. And he found his brother, his friend, Bartholomew. He went and talked to him about Jesus. You know, friends are a wonderful thing to happen, have, have in your life. A wonderful thing to have in your life. Do you talk to your friends about Jesus? Well, I'm afraid I'll ruin a good friendship. What kind of friend are you? If you don't talk about Jesus to them. If you know the way to heaven and you don't tell them, what kind of friend are you? And then the Bible mentions Thomas. Thomas. And whenever the Word of God mentions Thomas, what name do we often think of? We think of doubting Thomas. Don't be a doubting Thomas. You know, I think we kind of give Thomas a bad rap on that, to be honest with you. Because if you read about Thomas in the Bible, some of the greatest affirmations of faith of anyone in the Bible come from Thomas. They come from Thomas. Now, what was he guilty of? Well, you know the story. You know that after Jesus was crucified and buried, then the Bible tells us that on a Sunday he appeared on a Sunday evening to the apostles, but Thomas was not with him. In other words, he missed the Sunday night service. Well, let's not be too harsh about it. You can't even get anybody to come Sunday night. We don't even have many more. But he missed the Sunday night service, didn't he? He wasn't there. And so they told him throughout the week, we've seen Jesus. We've seen the Messiah. He's alive. And Thomas said, I need more evidence than that. I need more evidence than that. You tell me you've seen him. I, need, I want to see him for myself. Again, we call him a doubter for that reason, but put yourself in his place. Suppose, that, suppose a man died and you went to his funeral. You saw him in the casket. You saw him there. And you went with him to the graveside and you saw him lower the casket with him in it down into the grave. You saw all of that. Would you come to church the next week and expect the fellow to be standing there greeting you? 
Matter of fact, I dare say if he stood there and greeted you, you'd probably pass out. Amen? Thomas said, I need more evidence. But when Jesus appeared the next Sunday, Thomas fell on his face and cried out, my Lord and my God. That was Thomas. And then, of course, the Bible also mentions Matthew. And we've talked about Matthew. Matthew, the the publican, the tax collector, who worked for the Roman government. And, And so as a tax collector, he would have been hated. Now, the next name that is mentioned after Matthew is Simon Zelotes. Simon Zelotes. Simon the Zealot. That's what Mark called Simon the Zealot. Now, you put those two together, and I think about that. You know what the zealots were, don't you? The zealots were those who had such a passion for Israel, the nation, that they organized themselves as a militia group. Their desire was to overthrow the government of Rome if they could. They planned, they schemed, they worked at it. They tried everything that they could. Eventually, they had a war against Rome because they were determined, we're going to cast off the chains of the Roman Empire. They hated everything that, that, that harmed Israel. And Simon was one of those zealots. Matthew was a tax collector who worked for the Roman government. I'll tell you, Simon would have just put a dagger in his back if he could have. He'd have happily killed him. He saw him as a traitor. But Jesus changed both their lives. Jesus changed both of their lives. And the Lord puts the two right here together. Here is Matthew, the former tax collector, working for the Roman government. Here is Simon, who hated anybody who would do that, would think of them as a traitor. But God saved them, and they became brothers in Christ, working for the same army, loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing, if you stop and think about it, that God brings different personalities together, different folks of all walks of life. He brings them together, doesn't he? And uses them for his glory. And finally, Judas Iscariot, the one that was mentioned last. But I want you to notice a few things that apply to you and me very directly about this list of names and about these folks. First of all, it encourages me because I see from this that Jesus is willing to use ordinary people. Ordinary men. Just common, ordinary men. Jesus is willing to use them. What do you have? You have four fishermen. You have a tax collector. You have others. We don't know what they did, but they were just common, ordinary guys. Now, sometimes we think of Peter and James and John, and we think of those folks like that, and we almost want to make them supermen. I'll tell you, they did not wear caps and capes and gowns and masks and they didn't fly in the air and and they didn't jump on buildings like spider-man I mean they didn't do those things they were just ordinary guys that's all they were just normal kind of folks and they did the things that ordinary folks do sometimes they got jealous of one another they quibble over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom sometimes they talk about each other sometimes they get discouraged Sometimes they lose their temper and say what they shouldn't say. They were common, ordinary people. That's what they were. But the Lord God said, I can use you and I will use you. You know what the one quality they needed? They needed when the Lord called, they needed to answer, Here am I, Lord, send me. As soon as God called, here am I, send me. They responded to the call of God. I'm glad today that God can take an ordinary folk. God uses all kinds of people. He uses educated people and uneducated. He uses wealthy people and poor people. He uses skinny people and fat people. He uses tall folks and short folks. He uses older people and younger folks. I mean, God can can use anybody if they're willing to be used of the Lord. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. Why does God do that? 1 Corinthians 1.29 says that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
the Lord says, I don't want you glorying and thinking that he, you're the one that's so special. It's God in you. Christ in you is what's really special. He uses ordinary people. Brother Juan, not only does he use ordinary people, but he only needs a few. He only needs a few. Sometimes we think, oh, there's more power in the multitudes. God needs a few. The Marines were not the first to coin that phrase that we just want a few good men. I mean, God just needs a few good men. That's all he needs. You know that? That's all he needs. You don't find God needing a multitude. You don't find him needing a big committee. Matter of fact, I'm convinced there's one time he had a committee. They were, he, he said, all right, I'm going to let you all help me create a horse. And when the committee got through with it, they had a camel. And he dismissed the committee and didn't have one after that. Amen. I mean, he said, I don't need many. I just need a few. That's all I need, just a few. Because with God, just one man in God is always a majority. Did you hear me? One man in God is always a majority. You remember the story of Shamgar? You remember Shamgar? Well, if you don't, I don't feel bad. There's only two verses in the Bible that even speak of him. Two verses in the Bible speak of Shamgar. He was one of the judges. And in Judges 3 and 31, listen to what the Bible says of Shamgar. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad. And he also delivered Israel. The Bible just says that. Killed 600 men. What was an ox goad? An ox goad was a stick. It's what they used to, to poke the ox and keep it moving whenever it wanted to, to, uh, to bow up and stop. He'd just poke him with the ox goad. <laughs> he took that stick and killed 600 Philistines. Wow. He took what he had, just what he had, and he used it to the glory of God. Do you know that's all that God wants you and me to do? He wants us just to take what we have and use it for his glory. You don't have to have much. You don't have to have great talent. You don't have to have great, uh, great oratorical ability. You don't have to, have, you don't have to be able to, to read Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. You don't have to have several degrees after your name. You don't have to have anything like that. All you have to do is say, Lord God, I'll take what I have, and what I have I'll give to you for your glory. That's what Shamgar did. You remember Gideon? Remember Gideon? The Midianites with an innumerable, an innumerable host, easy for me to say, but an innumerable host, that was their army was described that way, a huge number of soldiers, and they were lording it over Israel, attacking Israel, and God needed a deliverer, and he chose Gideon. God spoke to him, Hail, mighty man of valor, and Gideon scared to death. Who, me? And God said, I need you to lead my army. You're going to overthrow the Midianites. Overthrow, Lord, you know how many soldiers? That, I, you can't even count how many soldiers in their army. Yeah, but you're going to overthrow them. So I'm going to give you an army. So Gideon put out the call. 32,000 men showed up. <laughs> Gideon's feeling pretty, pretty fired up now. I mean, you know, General Gideon, General Gideon with his 32,000. Lord, we're ready. Well, we're going up against the Midianites. And God said, no. That's not your army. That's, that's way too many. Lord, we don't need all of them. They got an innumerable host. Lord, that's not your army. He said, I want you just to tell them if you're afraid, you can go home. All of you who are afraid. So Gideon went up there and he announced, if you're afraid, you can go home. 22,000 of them went home. Now it's not General Gideon, it's Captain Gideon. And Captain Gideon said, well, there's only 10,000 left, but I guess, or we'll go. The Lord said, no, that's too many. What? I had 32, two-thirds of them left, and you're telling them I have too many now? Yeah, I have too many. So he said, I want you to take them through the desert, get them good and thirsty, then take them to a watering hole, and I'm going to give them a watering hole test. So Gideon marched them all over the place, and they went to the watering hole. Gideon said, get you some water. 9,700 of them. 9,700 of the 10,000 rushed to the water and they just dove almost head first in it, put their face down there and they're just drinking for all it's worth. 300 guys crept up to the water looking, watching for the army of the Midianites and got down on one knee, cupped a little water in their hand, began to lap it like a dog all the time watching for the enemy. 
And God said, send the, the 9,700 home. By the 300 men that lap like a dog, that's going to be your army. What? What? Lord, I had 32,000. Now you left me with 300. I'm telling you, you can take it. You can get a crown. As long as Jesus was passing out free fish sandwiches, thousands followed him. Did you notice that? Thousands followed him. But whenever he cut off the food and started talking about the cross, they almost every one of them left. He got down to 12, and one of them was a traitor. 300. And God said, that's your army. And God delivered the Midianites into the hands of Gideon with his army of 300. Because God was saying, it's not you, Gideon. It's not your army. It's not your strength. It is me with you that will cause the victory. You remember Samson? Samson killed a, a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an animal. A thousand of them with a jawbone. Mm. There have been a lot of folks killed in church with jawbones too in a different way, if you know what I mean. But I mean, he killed a thousand Philistines with a jawbone. You say, what gave Samson his power? And you'll, oh, oh, preacher, I know, call on me. I know it was his hair. It was his hair. No, it wasn't. No, go home and get some more sleep. It wasn't his hair. It was his God. It was his God that gave him victory. It was his God that gave him power. It was not Shamgar. It was not his strength, but it was God's strength working through him. God's strength working through Gideon. Just a few. That's all it takes. I want you to notice also about these men. Jesus calls deeply committed men. Deeply committed folks. That's who he calls. Ordinary people. Only needs a few, but deeply committed. Deeply committed. They left everything. You hear me? They left everything. They left their jobs, their occupation. They left their future. They left, they left their dreams. They, they left their hobbies. They left everything. They just left it all because they, they're following Jesus. And who are they following? They're following a man who was a king, but he didn't have a throne. They couldn't see the kingdom. He didn't have a crown. He didn't even own a house. He didn't wear the royal robes. As a matter of fact, he just carried around a basin and a towel and washed people's feet. But they knew he was the king. And they said, we're following him. And they followed him all the way to the cross. And watched him die. Because they said, you have the words of life. Where else are we going to go? And their reward came three days later when that one who was crucified and buried came to life again and appeared before them the risen Savior. Deeply committed people. And then Jesus chooses divinely empowered people. Divinely empowered. Notice that the Bible says back in Matthew Chapter 10, it says Jesus gave them power. The word is exousia. Exousia means authority. He gave them power, authority over the demonic to cast out the demons and to heal all manner of diseases among them. He gave them power. And I want to tell you something, friend. That same power that he gave is available right now. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You say, preacher, you, you, you mean that you believe that, that if he told you to cast out a demon, that you cast out a demon? If God told me I could, I could. If God said do it, you could. I'm telling you what God tells you. You say, you, you believe that God can, can use a person 
to, to help bring healing in somebody's life, pray for them, they be healed. If God tells you to pray for them and they be healed, I've seen it happen. I've watched it happen. I've seen it happen. Where you pray for someone, God tells you to pray for them, and God answers that prayer because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It's just the problem is we want the glory. We want the limelight. We want to think it's us. It has nothing to do with us. Nothing whatsoever. It is Christ in you. It's Christ in me. Whatever God needs you to be and whatever God needs you to do, you can do it. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He uses divinely empowered men. And the last thing, God calls successful men. Successful men and women. Isn't it an amazing thing? That God chooses the undeserving to be his people and the unqualified to do his work. You ever thought about that? God chooses the undeserving to be his people and the unqualified to do his work. Do you believe you deserve to go to heaven? You believe you deserve God's salvation and God's mercy? I know I don't deserve it. If somebody said, do you deserve it? I'd have to be the first one to sit down. I, I, there's no way in the earth I deserve it. If I got what I deserve, I deserve to go to hell. God chooses the undeserving to bestow his mercy on them that they might become his people. And God uses the unqualified to accomplish his work. They were successful. Now, when I say they were successful... They weren't successful by the world's way of thinking. Far from it. Oh, no. They weren't going to appear in anybody's who's who. They weren't successful in the eyes of the business world, the political world, the Roman world. I mean, no, anything but that. As a matter of fact, they died as criminals. They died. People thought they were fools. But they were successful. They were successful because they were faithful. They did what God called them to do. In our world today, we like to substitute the real thing, the real power, a real anointing of God. We, we like to come up with all kinds of little pithy sayings and slogans and, and so forth. And, and so we, we, our, we have all kinds of good slogans. We put them on our website and so forth. And then we can tell other people, we have the best website. We have the best mission statement. We got the best this or the best the other. Truth of the matter is, Southern Baptists have always sort of been that way. They used to have in 1954, they, they had a slogan. They called it a million more in 54. That's what they called it. Now, I wasn't born until 55, so I wasn't around to, but I heard all about it, a million more in 54. Vance Havner said this. He said, bless God, if we get a million more like we've already got, we're sunk for sure. <laughs> no, God uses ordinary people. God only needs a few. He uses deeply committed, divinely empowered people to be successful in his work. And he calls us to say to the world, he's worth it. Jesus truly is worth it. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you will use these simple words, this message, to challenge our heart to be what you'd have us to be. God, forgive us. For not having the zeal and the passion and the love that you would want us to have, God, that our hearts grow cold sometime and indifferent. We get so caught up in other things. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me. God, help us to say to the world, our Savior is worth everything. And we will gladly forsake all to follow you. Help us to do it. 